Welcome back, everybody, to a little less fear podcast. Today, I'd like to introduce Patty D. Maselli. She's born in the Queen of Angels Hospital in Los Angeles, California. Patty knew she was chosen, though she didn't know why. And then she discovered a small lump behind her daughter Amber's ear in August of 1979. It was a discovery that would change her life, her destiny, and the world. Patty's story, chronicled in her book, Embrace the Angel, challenges the notion of death and invites us to use the power of crossing the threshold to transform this world for the better. She is a life coach, an end-of-life doula, a certified grief educator, as well as an entrepreneur. Calling herself a student of life and a pebble thrower in the still pond of life, Patty has given Tiny Peter Guardian Angel Coins, also known as pebbles, to thousands of people as she travels the world. Welcome to A Little Less Fear podcast, Patty. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on. That's so kind of you. And I really enjoyed our little talk before we went on camera. And <laughs> me too. Um, thank you. I'm looking forward to exploring ourselves in life. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Patty. Patty, I'd like to know about your journey. What brought you to where you currently are at today? Wow. I know it's well, a loaded question. I know. It's a loaded question. Yeah, well, my journey uh, started in the womb. I remember being in the womb. Wow. Um, yeah, I remember, uh, not with words because it was pre-verbal, but I do remember the sensations, what I, when I opened my eyes, what I saw, you know, what I felt physically and emotionally. Um, I remember being born and it was the most excruciatingly painful experience I've had so far in life. Uh, I remember emerging into this blinding white blue light room that was extremely cold. And I heard clanking of, you know, really hard sounds on my ears. And then I got hit. I was yeah. like, welcome, you know? Right. Um, and I do believe that uh, most human beings do remember, but not with words. And it's been scientifically proven that we do have pre-verbal memories. You know, um, crazy petties. I've heard this story many times, but never from somebody that I've met in person. Now I'm actually meeting somebody that remembers this. I, I'm, I'm dying to know, did you find out that, how did you realize that you were remembering the womb? When did you realize that it was a womb memory? Was it later in life or was it maybe like, um, I guess like flashbacks during your lifetime? How did it happen? No, it, I was fully present at that moment, wow. at each moment, fully present. And um, well, maybe because I chose my parents and I chose them for a particular reason. Well, let me back up even further than the womb. Sure. I'm an angel in an oh so human body. I believe, I believe it. I believe you 100%, I, Patty. Yeah. I didn't admit that out loud, and I literally said it out loud about two years ago, but I, I knew it all along, but I didn't feel worthy of saying it or thinking it or believing it, but I'm willing to say that now. Thank you. Um, I believe all of us start off as angels from the quote unquote other side, the side that we don't see, feel, hear, touch with our senses. Mm -hmm. And we actually enter into this body, this world, this life. So I've lived in other bodies and other lives. Uh, this is my last one that I'll be living in. I'm certain of that. Uh, so knowing the, the all knowing mm -hmm. as angels do, um, I, I was always fully present and was quite cognizant and aware of what my human experience was going through. You know, I remember peering out like the, the bars of my crib yeah, and, and having feelings of couldn't, again, it's pre-verbal. I having feelings of this is not right. This is, this is just not right. This doesn't, you know, it was really the sense of injustice started very early. Um, I had very abusive parents. Both of them were um, alcoholics and my father was very narcissistic. Um, I had an older sister who was extremely abusive of me, beat me up constantly and stuff. So two younger brothers. But even during those traumatic times of childhood, I was I was going to Catholic school. I was the only one of the kids that went to Catholic school. I went to the Sisters of Charity with the, you know, the flying nun kind of habits yeah is that in santa monica 
Uh, no, it's actually Maryvale Orphanage, which is in uh, now Rosemead, but it was oh, a really, okay. oh wow, out my way. Okay. Yeah, so it was Maryvale Orphanage. Um, I went to the day school, but I wanted to be in the orphanage really badly because wow. the orphans were treated so beautifully, and you know I was treated like very badly at home. But even during that whole experience. Um, I was connected to the other side, the, the source of the divine by like a golden thread. And I would, I could actually visualize that golden thread directly connected to me. And I always was, I've, I've always been able to communicate with that. How was this golden thread connected to you? To your head, your crown, crown chakra? Or like oh, Yes. Right through the third eye, right through oh, wow. me here. Mm -hmm. um, and I can see it sometimes. And it's uh, the thread is a, a actually a human you know invention if you will but yeah it's that it's the connection it's that pathway that i that i feel connected i've always felt that connection wow that's beautiful so what happened after um after <clears throat> remembering your childhood and stuff i mean you had a rough childhood yeah what happened after that um well you know, I left home at 16. Um, my father beat me up and I was like, I can't, I just can't do this. So I, I moved in with a friend, Terry and her dad, who was divorced. And it was like, oh, I could finally rest and not have to walk on glass shards. You know, it was really good. Um, so I lived with them for a while. And then I met Amber's father, my daughter's father, you know, when I we took that, that West Coast to East Coast, me and Jan, my girlfriend uh, from high school, we went to the three day, three night trip across the U.S. to Vermont uh, to her sister who was having a baby, Nancy. And that's when I met Michael, Amber's father. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, he looked like an Adonis, if you will, you know, dark curly hair and big blue eyes. <laughs> and um, I fell in lust. That was the first time I fell in lust. Oh. So, you know, I didn't really know what true love felt like because I hadn't ever experienced it except with the divine but no other human mm -hmm. and so I didn't know and so I made mistakes you know I thought that because somebody physically loved me that they truly loved Patty the person but mm -hmm. that wasn't true um so anyway I you know as any victim of narcissism knows that you you know try to make your dreams come true whether it's true or not you you know, it's cognitive dissonance. Yes. And, you know, I didn't want to believe that he didn't love me and, you know, lots of other stuff. And we moved back to Connecticut where he was from and uh, we were in the country and it was very abusive. And I was in the hallway. Amber was a year and a half. Um, and I always had this premonition that I would die before Amber was six. I didn't know why I didn't have any answers. So I documented our life together. And so when she was a year and a half, Michael was like beating me up and, and in the hallway. And I remember looking down at Amber and she was terrified and her little face was all puffy and crying. She was screaming. And I literally saw myself in her. Wow. And I just said, I can't do this to her. So I, the next morning I took my wedding ring off, put it on the dresser and said, I want a divorce. And it was quite hard. It was very, very, very difficult. So Amber and I took a train down to New York City. We took a Greyhound bus to L.A. to my parents who were abusive, but it was the only place that I could go. Um, and, you know, I lived for a while with a wonderful friend, Patty, and, uh, and my brother. And then, Her name was also Patty? I know, I know. I know. <laughs> we're still really good friends. Um, and then, you know, I, I was trying to make a go of it. I was doing artwork and like walking the streets, literally the downtown area of Whittier with my paintings, trying to make yeah. money. And it was quite difficult as a single mom. Um, then I ended up um, saving cereal box tops and the people in um, Altadena Baptist Church where I was going to church, they actually saved box tops. So Amber and I could buy tickets on the train to go back to Connecticut where Jan um, had, a, there was a little two room apartment that I rented there in Milford, Connecticut. And so, and I actually documented everything, as I said, because I thought I was going to die and I wanted Amber to know me. 
So I have a movie of me and Amber taking the train from LA to Pasadena, actually, to <laughs> Chicago, and then Chicago to New York City. And wow. I actually bought a, a bike for $10 in a thrift <laughs> shop. So I had a bike, I had a wooden suitcase, I had Amber, and I ended wow. up at Grand Central Station during rush hour. And oh my goodness. Amber and I, and the $10 bike, you know, with a little seat on the back for her, sitting dur during rush hour. People, you know, just swirling, as you know, Grand Central Station, and ended up uh, finally getting the train to Milford and then got our little two-room apartment in Milford. And we lived there. Um, I found a, a job in uh, at Waterbury Locks. It was a lock factory down in the, on the green in Milford. And, um, yeah, it was it was extremely challenging, you know, having no, having no car. I, I would put Amber on the back of in the seat of my bike, bundle her up. So all you could see were little eyeballs, you know, it was <laughs> winter. So it was snowing, you know, it was like, wow. Well, how old was Amber her. one? Pardon? How old was Amber? By then she was uh, about two. Oh yeah. And so we, I would ride her, drop her off at daycare and then I would drive, ride my bike to work and then I'd pick her up and we'd come back. But, you know, honestly, you know, it was a, it was a beautiful life. It was she and I, there wasn't anybody abusing us. It was, you know, she, we, she would wash the dishes with me and I had a little chair that, you know, she'd stand on and it was, it was really a beautiful life. So, um, so, you know, that lasted for some time. Um, my sister, Kathy, uh, had helped me buy a car. I got a car finally. And I thought, oh gosh, what could I do where I could make enough money to uplift Amber in my life? So I said, well, maybe construction. So I ended up um, driving around <laughs> to different, um, in Connecticut, to different uh, construction sites, which at the time, they were all men. There was no women in construction. Wow. And I would drive up and they would laugh at me and they would laugh me right off that site. And I went to many, many construction sites all over Connecticut. But one time I went to a construction site, it was Denny's, it's still there actually, Denny's off of I-95, just before you get to New Haven, Connecticut. And the, the guy said, the head of the, you know, the head person there said, if you show up tomorrow at 7 a.m. with a tool belt and a hammer, you've got a job. <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> and it was like, oh my gosh, it was $7 an hour. Um, I was so, so excited. And so the first day I was roofing, I was doing roofing up in the, the Denny's, I was putting on a new roof. And I was, I remember holding the roofing nails and just hammering all day long, but I was loving it because it was something I could do to make my life better with my daughter. That's beautiful. But I ended up banging my thumb so much, my thumb was like bloody and twice its size. Wow. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Yeah. But the cool thing is, oh, there's Felix. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um oh so um I, the word got around in the in the construction industry and at the time it was I think it was just past that they wanted 10 percent of all construction workers to be women so I had these this visit from the laborers union come up to me at the job site on Denny's and they were like hey we'll give you 850 an hour if you join the union and you come work for us at on the tele it was teletrack it's still there actually in New Haven Connecticut and I was like, oh, my God, that would be fantastic. So I ended up going there and I was the only woman amongst 350 men. Jeez. And they wanted me first couple of weeks. They really wanted me out of their world. <laughs> but then I was like, you know, I knew I had to survive and I had to make money for Amber and me. So I was like, they're not going to quit. So what I ended up doing is kind of they kind of come at me with like a smart remark and I would have to like shoot something back. And it just became this dance. Yeah. I can't imagine. And, well, yeah. And I just came right back at him. And finally they were like, Hmm, okay. We're not going to break her. We might as well take her. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it was not really, break really her, cool. Might as well take her. Yeah. And they did, they accepted me. There was like 20 porta potties on the job site that all said men on the front. And they took a marker and they put W-O in front of one of them and gave me my own 
porta potty. Oh, that's amazing. That's so good. I worked there for a long time and until it was complete. Wow. Um, and then I ended up waitressing there and then I ended up being a, a laborer in the union. Um, they were digging the foundation for a part of New Haven Hospital, Yale New Haven Hospital. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. I know. I love, <laughs> I love this story. I can picture it all. As you're telling me, I can just see it all like a movie. So what happened after after all that? So um, the one of, one of the guys on the web, uh, excuse me, the um, construction site and Teletrack uh, would kept trying to get me to date his friend, and I was like, no. One of the rules I said is I am not dating anybody. Anyone you work with. I know. No way. No how. I mean, you can imagine what would happen, right? <laughs> so anyway, he, he kept trying to convince me, convince me, and I'm like, okay, I'll just I'll meet him. So I met Gary and he had Todd, who was three and a half and Amber was three at the time. Oh, wow. And Todd had blonde. Yeah, Todd had like blonde hair and Amber had dark curly hair with big blue eyes. And uh, I was trying to get Amber into modeling and I had just gotten her into modeling. She did a couple of ads and um, we were then we actually took modeling photos of Amber and Todd because he was blonde and she was had dark hair. Really yeah. beautiful photos. The contrast was probably really yeah. beautiful. And I opened up an art studio, and so Gary and I ended up getting together. I opened up an art studio. Uh, it was actually uh, three. It was Studio Three, which was a commercial graphic art studio um, on the Green in Milford on the second floor. And then the second one was called the Artist Gallery. And it was all the artists, like I would have someone do paintings. Once a month, we'd have openings and when they, someone would do a 3D sculpture. And then the, my favorite part of the business was called the Kids Studio. And I don't teach art, but I provide materials and guidance to people who are already artists. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so I, I had kids that were from three to 12 once a week at the Kids Studio. And I had six kids, so three and four-year-olds, five and six, seven and eight. And I had the kids' studio, and I absolutely loved it. <laughs> and they did, too. And so that was a really, really great business. And on, on the graduation from the kids' studio, I the kids would come up the stairs. And, of course, I had a smock on that had, like, paint all over it. And they were just like, oh, hi, Miss Patty. You know, it's so <laughs> sweet. And so I said, one time they came up, it was the very last time I had this butcher paper all down the hallway so it was probably 20 feet long taped to the floor and I said to the kids okay take your shoes and socks off now we're gonna paint with our feet <laughs> that sounds fun so, yeah they did so they painted this really beautiful mural with their feet and um and then we had this graduation you know where I dipped like feathers in gold and you know like a certificate it was just it was really magical you know it was just magic it sounds yeah. magical. It sounds beautiful. beautiful I love memories. it. So, um, so then after that, um, shortly after that, actually, I was um, I was homeless for a little while, and it was one of a few times I've been homeless with Amber, and we were living uh, in my Volkswagen, and uh, you know we pulled behind like the grocery store and put newspapers on the on the windows. I was working construction at the time, and I would take like you know baths in like gas station you know bathrooms and stuff like that and bathe amber and it was quite intense but um I, so I wrote a letter to the editor of the Milford Citizen and I said I'm really trying to raise my daughter but I, I can't seem to to you know get enough money and to find a place to live that we can afford so this beautiful woman and she was definitely a, a superintendent angel I tell you Sue Kelly she called herself Bambi she contacted the newspaper and said, hey, we have, I can rent her a room. I'm living alone. I can rent her a room for $25 a week. So Amber and I lived with Bambi and um, she was an amazing, amazing woman. And um, it was August of, um, oh gosh, August of, wow. Now I'm losing it here. Uh, 1979. Yeah, that's far back. 40 something years ago. Anyway, August of 79, I'm stroking Amber's hair, putting her to sleep, hot night. And I just, I felt this big lump behind her ear. It was about the size of a walnut. 
Oh, wow. And, uh, and I, and I, she was like falling asleep and I just pulled her hair back and I'm like, and my thought was, oh my God, cancer. And I didn't even know kids got cancer. I didn't know what it looked yeah, like. Yeah. I had no idea. And I heard, and when I say heard, it wasn't like a voice. It was a knowing, but it, it was into words. I heard, it's not you who will die. It's Amber. Wow. And so I spent the next eight months traveling the state of Connect, Connecticut. I went to eight different doctors, including the head of pediatric surgery at Hartford Hospital, trying to convict, convince them to biopsy it. And they just, I got everything from, don't worry, lots of kids get lots of lumps and bumps. And, you know, it couldn't possibly be cancer and lots of other things. In the meantime, I had taken, a friend of mine was a radiologist that had taken photographs and it was showed, showing that it was growing. Um, then she fell and hit it on a fireplace in mm, February, I think, of the next year, which was 1980. And it doubled in size. And I took her to the emergency room. Wow. They brought her. They said, we're going to operate on her. And the night before surgery, they were saying it can't possibly be cancer. So when they came back, she had it excised. Um, they said it's, it's rhabdomyosarcoma. It's in the third stage. And I was like, wow, wait a minute. You're telling me it couldn't possibly be cancer. And I was telling you it might be cancer. And now you're saying it is. So we went through, you know, I went through the whole experience of that. I gave her radiation and they excised it. They operated and took it out. And then I didn't want to give her chemotherapy because um, that was, it's still experimental to some degree. They're still experimenting, but it was very experimental. And so I, when Amber was discharged from Yale New Haven, um, I went to the New Haven Register and begged the editor to please let me print a public plea. And this was before the internet. So I, he did, he went on the front page and I basically asked, is there any other cancer therapies out there in the world? Mm -hmm. The Associated Press picked up that story and it went all over the world. And the media immediately contacted me. I got telegrams, um, phone calls and I have all, I still, I've documented everything. And uh, we ended up um, because we were in the media and the AP was following the story and the news and the TV and all that. Um, we ended up, there was an angel um, from Greenwich, Connecticut, Mrs. Newington. She offered to pay for us to get immunotherapy from Dr. Lawrence Burton in oh, Freeport, wow. Bahamas. It wasn't here in the US and Dr. Burton was one of the innovators or the inventors, if you will, um, discoverers of immunotherapy. And he was at St. Vincent's and he was kind of banished to the Bahamas. Oh, wow. Still doing trials. So he couldn't do any Americans, but many people um, went to the Bahamas Freeport. So um, Dr. Burton agreed to treat Amber for free. Wow. Um, Mrs. Newington gave us the money to find an apartment because it was a clinic. So they had no place. It wasn't like a hospital. So we ended up having to sneak out of the country. Um, because I was afraid they would take Amber away from me because a lot of young children, um, and even now today, if you don't give them what chemotherapy and radiation and surgery, if you don't give them the protocol that our medical establishment demands, they will take your child away Wow! and make that child a ward of the court. Oh my and that was all in the newspapers. Um, Joey Hoffbauer, Chad uh, Green, many of many of the young kids at the time. And I was like, Oh my God, they can't take Amber away. I'm a good mom. So we ended up going to the Bahamas. Um, I arrived there and was there for two weeks. I had brought my $10 bicycle. So I was able to ride my bicycle to an Amber to the clinic. And um, two weeks after we were there in May of 1980, Dr. Burton was on 60 minutes on Sunday night, the next day, Monday morning, People from all over the world were at Dr. Burton's clinic. There was a line that went around the block. People wow. with air ambulances and, you know, their last hope basically was immunotherapy. So I ended up, uh, the therapy involved drawing, or we called it pulling, but drawing Amber's blood. And then Dr. Burton would measure the protein fractions. He isolated four that made up the immune system. And then from good 
human donated blood, you would isolate the same protein fractions and put them into one cc syringes. Mm -hmm. So I would draw her blood. A couple of hours later, I would get four syringes and then I would have to inject her and her little buns, basically, um, inject these protein fractions into her. And um, it was an amazing experience. And again, you know, you can see all of this in her book. It's a, there's a free PDF, an ebook on our website, Embrace the Angel. So I've got a lot of photos, color photos in it. One of the things that Gary and I came, Gary came with me, uh, Todd's father. And, and in order for Amber to get used to this therapy, we had her draw Gary's blood. She was, she was three, oh, wow. she was three and a half at the time. Oh, wow. She drew, and it's, I've got photos of this, drawing Gary's blood. And then she would take like grape juice for blood and inject her little stuffed animals. Oh, <laughs> and, uh, and it worked actually. The therapy worked. Um, the, the metastasis that had started began to flatten wow. and I have photographs of the flattening. Um, but then she got tonsillitis and the immune system, her immune system could not keep up. And, uh, because we had left the country, we couldn't find an American surgeon to help us what they call debulk the tumor. Remove what you can. Mm. Dr. Burton actually paid for for um, David Stewart. He owns hospitals in Montreal, Canada. He brought surgeons down to Freeport to examine Amber to see if they could save her life. And Dr. Burton paid for us to fly up to Montreal wow. to get testing. Um, and so they tried for a week, but she was off the immunotherapy and it began to really grow. Wow. And so we had to go back to Freeport, but it, the immune, um, the immunotherapy couldn't keep up. We tried to find an American doctor to help us, um, but we couldn't. And then I finally found my friend forever. We're still friends, Dr. Bernie Siegel. And Bernie was incredibly brave. He said, I will take Amber, treat her as my own child wow. and assemble a team of surgeons to help her. Wow. And he did. And so we flew back into the country and went up to New Haven, admitted her to the hospital. She spent a week there and we tried to save her life. And it was, it was a really a pivotal point. Um, of my life and of the lives of so many that I serve in the world. I was standing in line in the gift shop. I wanted to buy Amber a little something while she was in surgery to make her feel better. And I heard, again, heard, yes. turn around. And I turned around and I saw this big rack of golden keys. Oh, here it is. And I keep this by my computer. It's a beautiful, wow, beautiful. golden key. Isn't that cool? It's gorgeous. So this is the key that I have today, but I heard at the time, give this to Amber and tell her it's the key to heaven. So when she's dying, she can open up the golden gates. And so I did. And I went down into the chapel and um, St. Raphael's Hospital, and I just heard, let her come to me. And that's when I decided to let her die and make the best part of the last time she had on earth. And Bernie was able to help us do that. You know, he was able to help me help her. Um, she chose the clothes that she knew she was dying and she was afraid at all to die. Uh, most children are not afraid to die. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. I'm an end of life doula. Um, and I've worked with children, a lot of children who are dying. And I have not seen one yet that's afraid. So we, tr we talked about it with Amber. You know, we did drawings, um, spontaneous drawings, where you can interpret a person's feelings and emotions through the drawings. Bernie actually introduced me to that. Um, she chose the clothes she wanted to die in, her school clothes. Um, on uh, October 29th, at about midnight, we sang happy birthday to me, me and Gary and Amber. Um, and I didn't realize it, but October 30th was my birthday. And just after midnight on my birthday, she slipped into a coma. And, um, that morning, um, we brought her down to the sofa 
and um, I, I have a transcript and I have audio recordings of this. You know, before she died, Lena, she said incredibly miraculous, like, again, she said things. She taught me so many things that I, I was just like, my, my mind was like blown. I'm like, oh my God, are you serious? So what I ended up doing, I have her whole life documented, but the last month I actually have cataloged every single thing she said. And it's all cataloged, which I, I'm writing another book. But two of the things that stand out, she said, mom, I know I'm here to help a lot of people. Wow. Because she was on the media and we had news crews coming in. So she was aware that people were on in the world that were watching her. And the second thing she said that came so true, she said, mom, when I die, I'll still be Amber. I'll just be different. Wow. What an awareness. Yeah. So she told me, she taught me what happens when our body dies. We simply change. Yeah. She, we she never left. Yeah. She never left. So she was in a coma. I was telling her how much I loved her. Thank you so much for showing me what love means, Amber. I love your buns. You got the best buns in town. <laughs> you know, I was just every single thing I wanted her to know. Yeah. And as I'm telling her this, she's laying, you know, on her back. And I see she's in a coma and I see tears start coming down. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, Gary, she's crying. And so I wipe her tears away. And then it was nonstop. It was like a flood of tears. Wow. And I realized she wasn't afraid to die. She was afraid to leave me behind. And so when I said the words, go now, be with God, Amber, be with God, she stopped breathing. And at the exact moment that she stopped breathing, I physically felt her leave her body. And move right through my own physical body. I was like, it was like a rush of light and love and peace. It felt like when you get goosebumps, like a times a thousand. I could feel it at the tips of my hair and my wow. fingernails. It was the same sort of feeling. And I, you, you may not understand this. Um, when you give birth, when you're in labor, and you're pushing that baby out, you can literally feel the fingertips in the head. You can feel that urge. Wow. And it was interesting because when I gave birth, I felt that same thing, except it was in reverse. It Amazing. was like her dying and moving through me. Wow. And so all I could say was, thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. I, all I felt was light and gratitude like I've never felt before and so um so because again we were in the newspapers and on tv um we could not find a surgeon to pronounce her dead at home oh my goodness but, yeah so I called Bernie and he's a surgeon so I said Bernie can you please come and pronounce her dead and so they could I could call the you know funeral home. yeah and uh, he said, Patty, I might be in surgery. So I tried calling like the fire department. They said, call the police department. I tried calling. I mean, I, I could not find people to help me. So Bernie said, Patty, just take Amber's body, put it in the back of your car, drive to St. Raphael's and they, and I'll, I'll make sure that they know you're coming. So I put Gary and I put Amber in the back of my, my Volkswagen square back, a station wagon. Like she looked like she was sleeping. I drove about 40 minutes to St. Rayfield's in New Haven. And as I'm driving, I'm looking at her dead in the back of my car. I'm looking at the people, life going by, right? I had no idea. And as I get off the highway and I just was about at the hospital, I heard, pull over. You need to take a picture of Amber. People need to see dead. Wow. So I pull over. I get out of the car with my camera. I open up the back. I take one picture and I drive to the hospital. And when I arrived, they were there. They brought a stretcher out. I picked up Amber's body. I put it on the stretcher. We went through the doors that opened and there were maybe 50 or more people all standing there. 
Wow. What a support system. You know, the world was watching and the world truly, truly cared. And, uh, you know, we waited for the funeral home. We were going to have her cremated. We got word they were there. I walked Amber on the stretcher down into the bowels of St. Raphael's. I saw the mortician in black with a black body bag at the end of that hallway. We walked down to the bag. I lifted her, her body up. I put her in the bag. I kissed her lips, were by then cold. And I zipped the bag up. And I was still filled with that beauty and that peace and that light. I was not crying. I was not even sad. I was absolutely transformed into Amber's light. So she was right. She never left. She's still here now, even between us. As I'm talking about her, she actually lives between us. Wow. Could you describe that a little more? How does she live between you? How do you feel her? How do you know when she's around? Is she always around? Oh, always. Always. And, you know, I'm surrounded by a circle of angels. Yeah. I'm an angel. Okay. I know it. And, and because I was willing a couple of years ago to say it out loud and finally take that role on and say, oh, yes, okay. Uh, I accept, you know, what was that? The Mission Impossible. The mission, if you choose to accept it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. Once I chose to accept my mission here on earth, I have the ability now to actually see the angel and others. Wow, Patty. It's incredible. That is incredible. Yeah. Whether it's Zoom or not. <laughs> yeah. I see the angel, you know, I do. Wow. I see... That's beautiful. I believe I it. I mean, I see the little one by three square. I see your skin. I see your what you're wearing. I love your tie and your hat, by the way. Oh, I, thank you. Yeah, I see your the beautiful background of, of wood. Is that cedar wood behind you? It's not real. Oh, I love <laughs> it, it. It's like a wallpaper. I love it. But I, I see the human and the, the physical and the temporal. But I also see, like I hear the divine speak through me the other side um i see your angel thank you so much i this is the first time i've cried in a podcast i mean i've done over 160 70 episodes really this is um it's hard to hold back my tears right now but um thank you so much for sharing that yeah. um can i can i just give you a little um a tidbit of love yes please of course of course. So Amber has, you know, like she's my greatest teacher, but she told me, and it's in the forward of Embrace the Angel. It's in the forward of the book. You can, as I said, get it online for free. But um, I wrote about it. She told me that tears are like liquid love. Wow. We cry because we feel and we feel because we care. So once she said that to me, I've learned never, ever stop the liquid love and never apologize for it wow you've really transformed me here in the hour that we've been communicating thank you so much so um it's been a beautiful story i guess i'm wondering when did you become a life coach and how did all of this impact you into becoming a life coach how did that develop well you know i um I'm 69, almost a half, but I'm 69, and I've learned so much in my life. My goodness, yeah, each each thing I try to learn. I'm a student of life, as I've mentioned. Um, and so I thought to myself, I woke up one day and I thought, wait a minute, what if I could, through all of my life lessons, gently guide others who are struggling? And so I said, I think I'm going to become a life coach. I think I have a lot to offer, you know, and I think yeah. that most people do that get to my age. Hopefully you learn and don't become bitter and closed. So I went, became a certified life coach and I absolutely adore it. And then the very next week I became an end of life doula 
through um, the International End of Life Doula Association, Inelda. And then just a year and a half ago, I became a certified grief coach, um, a certified grief educator through David Kessler's program and a coach, which I love. So um, I actually just recently, I'm just ready to, to go public and launch it, but I came up, so I have a company called Tobias and Company, which is my son's name. Uh, he's in the Navy. He and his wife, Kimberly, live in Washington State. And so I call it Tobias and Company after him. And I just launched, just about ready to launch my um, Love and Learn collection. Oh, I love that. <laughs> so I did. So I, you know, the last husband, I've been married three times. The last husband, number three, was a narcissist, but he was a malignant narcissist oh, wow. and nearly killed me. And so I imagined in my mind's eye, what could I do to save one other person from, you know, I suffered for 22 years. Mm -hmm. One other person, the heartache and the heartbreak and the torture that I endured. And so I, I saw in my mind's eye, somebody wearing a t-shirt with like a cliff notes, red flags of a narcissist, all the phases, what it looks like, what they say, what, you know, it's like a playbook. It literally is a playbook. And so I designed that, the red flags of a narcissist, have a nice graphic in the front. And then the second one I did was grief because I'm a grief educator. So what does grief look like? What are the types of grief? What do you say to people in grief? Um, so I did that one. And then I did one called HSPs, which stands for Highly Sensitive People. It's a book on uh, by Elaine Aaron. And 30% of the world's population are HSPs and I'm one of them. And it's a, it's a superpower, but it's put down by a lot of people like you're too sensitive and why you bought, you know, so it's just like put down, but I know other HSPs when I meet them. And so, and I've got some others, I'm working on love, I'm working on complex PTSD. So just to educate people, you know, real simple. Yes. So yeah, we have, you know, backpacks and puzzles and t-shirts and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, but yeah, it's a neat way for me to to transform my fear, pain, anguish, torment into positive ways, tiny things that I can do to help others. And so Tobias and company, um, you know, we also have like, a, I did Doors of Tuscany and I have a Naval Academy collection. We put them onto silk and stuff. So Tobias and company has a giving back division, which is embrace the angel. And we, I take angel drawings from kids around the world. Wow. Put them on silk pillows and then donate them to critically ill and grieving children. Oh, and so beautiful. it's so cool to be able to take, you know, what could be considered like red flags of a narcissist, right? Dark world to support light work. And wow. so it's a beautiful thing. We just have, we just graces angels is our latest pillow cover and embrace the angel, um, dot com. You can see that one. And uh, this little girl, Grace, collected 164 angels from kids around the world. Wow. And it took her four years to do it, but she did it. We created Grace's Angels pillows. And in the very center is an Ukrainian angel that we highlighted. And so Grace, just this week, is oh, sending wow. her pillow to Ukraine to, to Prague, where she went to the international. Oh, wow. oh. Wow. So it's going to go to the embassy first, Oh, whoa. American embassy. They're going to distribute it to 120 Ukrainian children in Prague. Oh, that's beautiful. And, and some of the kids, this is the coolest thing, Lino. Some of the kids that drew angels for Grace's Angels Pillow is actual, they're going to actually see their drawing on this silk satin pillow. That's so they crazy. will feel the power of, that they had knowing they were drawing this drawing for sick kids around the world and they will see it live and cuddle it, you know? How so it's just, cool. it's fabulous. I love it so much. You know, that is angel light work right there yeah. all the way, Patty. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I do too. You know, honestly, Lino, I'm blessed to know why I'm here on earth. I'm blessed. I'm really blessed. You found your life purpose. Yeah. Yeah. I really, I mean, I think, well, I knew it before I came into this body. Mm -hmm. um, but boy, oh boy, I fought it tooth and nail so many times. I'm like, God, why me? I'm so human. 
I mean, I burp, <laughs> you know, I do. Sure. I'm human. It was like, wait a minute, I'm unworthy. <laughs> I'm human. But then I heard that's exactly why I chose you because you are so human. And I was so like, what is your life purpose? Oh, to share Amber's story yes. and her message of hope, heaven, yes. and the miracle of life and death. Both are miracles. You know that. Yes, yes, absolutely. And just elevate others. I work right now um, with a population of elderly that um, are, you know, they're, there's, they need a lot of tenderness and a lot of caring. They're grieving. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. You know, and, you know, I have private clients that I coach through grief and life and, you know, end of life doula work. So, you know, I'm, I'm, gosh, Amber taught me how to live and how to die. It's the most you know? beautiful story I've heard in a long time, Patty. Patty, if you could take a time machine, a time capsule, and go back to the time where you had the most despair, the most pain, the most struggle, knowing what you know now, what would you tell yourself? Wow. Well, it was it was in December of 2017. It was at the height of my abuse from husband number three. I was standing at the top of the landing. We had to go to his family, uh, had a wedding up in New York. And I, I was so... I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where I was. I couldn't hardly breathe. I was just, twir- I was going in circles going, I need to pack. Where do I go? What, what do I-? I did not even know myself. I was crying uncontrollably. And I thought I'm dying. I'm dying right now. I have nothing to live for. And so to make the decision to divorce him and break free from the torture and torment, I had to learn how to literally breathe. Again, I had to, I had an app, a calm app. It was, t- you know, it, it was a breathing app. I know uh, the app. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, used to that app. I know it. Yeah. And I was literally, every, every night I'd have to like breathe with this thing because I didn't know how to breathe. When I met him, I was at the pinnacle of Maslow's hierarchy. I was self-actualized for 10 years. And by the end of the 22 years, I was literally at the bottom. But what I didn't know at the time was though, yes, I could return to my life path of serving others. And yes, I still had the power to share Amber's message and to elevate others. And, you know, I would just, I didn't, I didn't have, I didn't have hope, frankly. So, you know, there's a beautiful quote by George Isle, and it's one of my favorites. It's on the back of, it was five different Uh, words on the back of those little pewter guardian angel coins the pebbles it's hope is faith holding out its hand in the dark so in my moment of darkness i could barely envision me holding out my hand and i'm glad that i did because i'm here with you now and i'm here with your listeners and your watchers and your people that you're connected with that's beautiful patty Patty, this has been an amazing, an amazing Thank you. interview, and I'm forever blessed to have met you, have connected with you. I know we will forever be connected as well. I feel, I feel this incredible love unity between the both of us, and I'm really blessed that our listeners will get a chance to hear this incredible, beautiful story that you have to share. Wow. Where can our viewers or watchers and our listeners find you if they need to get a hold of you, if they need a life coach or a grieving coach, a coach right. or end-of-life doula? Well, uh, the, all of my light work, um, my coaching, um, my life coach and my end of life doula and grief educator and coach is on Patty Dimaselli, all one word, P-A-T-T-I-D-I-M-I-C-E-L-I, pattydimaselli.com. All that's there. All the, you know, the explanations, the cost, everything's right up front there. So if you want to learn more, um, Tobias and company is the, you know, um, company that supports our light work. So if you want to buy something that's really cool and interesting and fun that would help support um, Embrace the Angel, that would be awesome. Um, And then Embrace the Angel is really my super hub for my light work. That's where Amber lives. Um, Again, free ebook there. You can read all about me. Um, My life is literally an open book. Um, I've got lots of resources there as well. So Embrace the Angel is my light work. 
Well, I'm definitely embracing you. You are an angel without any doubt. And I wish you and all your loved ones an incredible holiday season, a happy new year. And thank you so much for sharing your wisdom light on a little less fear podcast. Well, well, thank you, Lino. Big hug. Right back at you. Big hug back at you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.